I'm Lee Venkat Ramani. I'm in the Division of Medical uh, Ethics and Health Policy. And I'm going to talk to you about work requirements and the Kentucky Medicaid Section 1115 waiver. So obviously, as we've talked about this morning, there's increasing interest in Medicaid work requirements. Uh, Kentucky is the first state that has uh, implemented these or got CMS approval to do so, but there are other states that have uh, active waiver applications in tow, and we think that Kentucky is not going to be the first. There may be disincentives in welfare programs to work, and that's an idea that goes back to the 80s or probably even before that. Um, there's also this thought that you can get a lot more towards poverty alleviation through incentivizing work. And there's this other idea that uh, work requirements and premiums and co-pays are all things that can help uh, socialize people into private insurance and help them transition away from government support. There's some skepticism that this is going to work. Um, so from the TANF experience, we know that there were work requirements uh, that were put in place in 1996. There was a short run increase in labor force participation and employment, but perhaps it was not durable. Um, and there was obviously a large number of people who, uh, or there were reductions in the number of people receiving assistance. Um, just as a side note, in the TANF experience, there were 12 states that actually um, allowed people to be uh, sanctioned on Medicaid if they didn't meet their TANF sanctions, and that's something that we're looking at as a, uh, as a policy effect. So there is some kind of historical precedent to what we're seeing now, it's just not that well known. So Kentucky, for a state, again, to have the Section 1115 waiver approved, and there's a number of components of it. The one that everyone is talking about is the community engagement. So this idea that um, you have to be participating in work or some other activity for at least 20 hours a week, um, there's also premiums that are a sliding scale based on federal poverty line. There's potential for lockouts if you don't um, apply and redetermine on time for Medicaid. And there's also behavioral incentives that they're trying to build into their larger policy. So importantly, Kentucky Health, this package of, uh, of different interventions, applies to about 350 to 400,000 people of the about 1.4 million people who are on Medicaid. And that's a, um, so it's a small fraction of the quarter of a state that are on the program. Um, and it, ideally, it targets able-bodied individuals, individuals, so those that would be able to work. And motivating this, uh, I think, from the Kentucky side, and, and something that we should all be interested in, too, is that red dot in Kentucky in the southeast are the eight counties that had the largest decline in life expectancy over the last 25 years. So this is obviously a real concern for the state, and there's a lot of generational poverty there, and the thought is that this kind of policy may shift the equilibrium to something that is that's happier. So um, we are actually going to be in a position to do this evaluation. We're the independent evaluation team. It's led by Kevin Volk, Kristen Underhill at Columbia, myself, uh, Kristen Lin, who's a biostatistician, and you all know Dan Polsky. Um, and you know, what we're going to try to do is leverage a number of different approaches. Uh, the chief among these will be hopefully a randomized controlled trial, which we'll talk about. And we have a lot of qualitative analysis that we'd like to do. And this is a five-year evaluation. <laughs>